Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be um, chairing this session, Public Sculpture in the Town and on Campus. Um, and before I introduce uh, our speakers, there are a few housekeeping items for you to take notice of. The session is being recorded, so if you have to leave for any reason before the end of the session, the video will be made available on Art UK's YouTube channel in due course. Closed captions are available thanks to live captioning by stage text. A transcript will be available after the conference on request. Participants who wish to, to use this should click on the CC button at the bottom of their screen to access the, quest, the captions. Uh, could you also please questions? Could you leave your questions via the Q&A button rather than the chat button. Um, you can do this at any time and questions will be put to the speakers after the first two papers when we have about five minutes for questions and at the end of the session. And could you, because we have four speakers, make sure that you indicate who your question is addressed to. That would be enormously helpful. So our session this afternoon is focusing on public sculpture how it's curated and presented in a variety of settings, in new towns in Scotland and in towns and cities in England, on the university campus and in the historic garden landscape. And one of the, the, the kind of range of issues that our speakers are all looking at is how these collections have developed, how they've evolved over time, and what the connections are between the sculpture and their various local communities, and indeed between the more transient viewing public of more temporary exhibitions or, or installations. Our first speaker is Andrew Demetrius, an artist, curator and researcher based in Fife in Scotland. He's currently researching his PhD in the School of Art History at the University of St Andrews, where he is curator. And his uh, topic is Scotland's New Town Art Movement. So over to you, Andrew. Right, okay, hi. This paper is intended as an introduction to the public art of uh, Scotland's five new towns, describing the situation that gave rise to this art, to look at ways in which this local grouping developed ideas that began elsewhere, and to reveal a reconceptualizing of the role of the artist, which in turn contributed to new forms of art. It will outline the typologies of new town art and trace a genealogy of the new town movement Following the Second World War, the Labour government of 1945 embarked on a programme of economic rebuilding and construction with a massive expansion of the welfare state to tackle the problems of public health, education, employment and social security. Housing was a pressing issue and due in part to wartime destruction, but also due to overcrowding, the poor condition of housing, existing housing stock and its location. The government commissioned regional plans to facilitate new economic development, which involved remodeling the ways and the places in which people lived and worked. The result of this was twofold. Redevelopment of the cities such as London and Glasgow and the building of high density estates and high rise and the decanting of the population to a lower density new towns clustered around London in the southeast and spreading across the UK where circumstances and economic strategy suggested need. The modern design of these new environments was very different to the terraces and tenements that they replaced, and it was soon realised that the severe and repetitive architecture and bleak landscaping would benefit from the humanising effects of visual art. In Scotland, there had been tentative experiments with art and building before the war, uh, for example, at the 1938 Empire Exhibition in Glasgow, in which modernist exhibition buildings, such as the Tate Tower, had been accompanied by sculpture and murals. This approach was greatly expanded 
for the 1951 Festival of Britain, which featured an army of architects, artists and designers working together to create a synergy that revivified national pride and belief in modernity as a better way of living. For the new housing, new schools and infrastructure around London, the London County Council had begun by commissioning established artists, but realized that there was potential to employ younger artists directly to improve efficiency and reduce costs. William Mitchell and Anthony Holloway, recent graduates from the Royal College of Art, were employed as design consultants to work with the architects on projects from 1958 to 68, thereabouts, producing many works integrated with building designs. Mitchell and other artists found commission work in the new towns where sculpture and murals were being acquired as part of their program to integrate arts and culture. However, others developed such approaches in different ways, notably at Peter Lee in County Durham, where the Town Development Corporation employed the artist, artist Victor Pasmore as consulting director of architectural design. Though never a town resident, Pasmore worked with planners and architects to develop the landscaping and layout of several districts, creating artworks that culminated in his famous or infamous Apollo Pavilion, which he called, quote, an architecture and sculpture of purely abstract form. The world of planners and architects was relatively small and aided by arts and architecture, the arts and architectural press, stories of these collaborations with artists began to circulate and other new towns became interested in doing something similar. So what exactly was a town artist? Well, the concept grew out of the post-war settlement and a desire for social and environmental improvement, combining a revival of Renaissance notions of artist as artisan, complete with workshop, and with modernist ethos whereby the artificial divisions between art and design began to dissolve. This was a rejection of romantic ideas of the artist as a lone genius, instead engaging directly with the workers and community around them. The appointment of town artists in Scotland emerged at an important point in the evolution of Britain's new towns. Following the slow progress of the first two decades of construction, architects and planners began to consider the implication of Lord Reith's New Towns Committee patrician mission statement on architectural environments and design aesthetics to produce what they called an essay in civilization to create the means for a happy and gracious way of life. The first Scottish new town to employ an artist was Cumbernauld, whose development corporation recruited Brian Miller in 1962 as a draftsman and designer with a freewheeling brief that presented opportunities and limitations. He also became the longest serving town artist upon his retirement 28 years later. Miller moved to live in Cumbernauld from Glasgow where he studied painting, but had an exceptional creative facility, adapting to concrete sculptures such as the car brain totem, you see on the left here from 1966, metal play sculpture, and working at scale with murals. As an adjunct to the planning department, Miller's additions often came too late in the design process to be more than augmentations, leaving them vulnerable to later redevelopments. He was also expected to devote much of his time to graphics and marketing, part of the new town promotion machine. But living in the town, he was a real presence, embedded in the development corporation and within the community. I'm going to use the new town of Glenrothes as a case study to briefly illustrate uh, the topologies of new town art. So the Development Corporation at Glenrothes in Fife commissioned the first sculpture for the town in 1965 from Estonia-born Scottish artist Benno Schutz to produce the imposing bronze Ex Terra from the town motto Ex Terra Vis, From the Earth Comes Life, on the popular new town theme of the family group. Glenrothes chief architect Merlin Williams approached Cumbernauld's Brian Miller to advise on the drafting of a job application uh, or job description for Glenrothes town artist and in turn David Harding learned the limitations at Cumbernauld. As town artist he insisted that a clause be inserted into every project uh, contract that the town artist should be consulted at all stages of the design process to be present at the beginnings from where the artist could have a real influence. He also foreswore any graphic design work as a distraction from the matter in hand, making sculpture. Again, this was a long-term project in which the artist was embedded both within the corporation and the community with an open brief that evolved into an inclusive sculptural practice. Harding was given a permanent position and provided with a council house, salary, studio, and access to everyone in the development corporation from hierarchy from the chief architect to construction workers, but no budget for materials. So the town artists adopted a pragmatic approach, aided by well-disposed planners and architects, 
engineering contingency funds were adapted to supply Harding with building materials, mostly concrete and brick, to create a wide range of sculpture, architectural, freestanding and surface-based works. The artworks are mostly spread across the residential districts and are in many ways a contrast and a challenge to the traditional notions of public art as monuments. Concrete, not bronze or stone, a ground level not raised on plinths, and among the community rather than in civic centres. Much of the work's integrity derives from its truths to materials, and the shared materiality with the surrounding architecture and infrastructure is a key part of embedding it within the environment. So it was that Harding's designs for brick patterns and brick spirals engaged the skills and creativity of bricklayers to break away from the repetitious formality of conventional construction and instead engage with the artistic concept and realize it through their own practice. The geometric abstraction of these brick designs was complemented by more figurative works around the town underpasses. This bleak image from Livingstone below contrasts with Glenrothes' massive industry mural which occupies the entire north and south wing walls of a pedestrian underpass. While the road above prioritizes traffic and pedestrians scurry through dark and menacing underpasses, they can enjoy Harding's hymn to the local industrial past and present. Mining, paper mills, and electronics are all represented in flowing semi-abstract designs. One side is signed by the artists, while the other features the names of the engineers and construction workers hidden within the design in recognition of their efforts and creative input. The design for the Queensway underpass was inspired by local flora found around the site which had previously been a farmland. As with industry, the work was carved in negative on large polystyrene sheets in the studio, transported to site and enclosed in timber shuttering. Concrete poured in from above and when cured, the mold and shuttering were removed to reveal the finished design. Community painted murals were added to the interior by local youth groups to establish a balanced creative input from the artist and the community. Other community projects included Harding working with a class from every school in the town to create terracotta tiles, which were affixed to nearby neighborhood walls. These tiles are still present and are a direct example of the ongoing intergenerational impact of town art, whereby the tile makers can show their children and grandchildren their enduring contribution to the local environment. Stanley Bonner was the first assistant to David Harding, made an indelible mark on the town with his design for the famous Glenrothes Hippo, a single mould used to produce a small herd of one and a half tonne concrete beasts that roam and cluster across the town. Their quiet, surreal yet friendly presence has grown with generations of residents to their present day status as official mascots of Glenrothes. Although not purposely designed as play sculptures, the ludic quality and position of many works invite climbing, games and touch, unlike the plinth stroke gallery context. There's also a more prosaic reason for the sighting of works in and around play areas. These projects contained a budget for such items. Given the town artist had no funds of his own, he had to think creatively with colleagues to find small sums of money with which to obtain materials. Harding described Rocket, the piece you can see on the left here, as a sermon in concrete, a pop art totem depicting the huddled mass of humanity being crushed by Cold War weapons technology. Sited within an award-winning play area, originally covered with sand, surrounded by a wall high enough to contain the space and with jutting brick patterns at several points to allow children to climb in and out. In the Patuka residential precinct stands Henge, a spiral of 13 upright concrete panels descending in height towards the centre. Blank and unassuming on the exterior, the panel's inner faces are a tour de force in casting technique, the use of aggregates and finishes. While this is the most personal of Harding's works, it's neither indulgent nor exclusive. Rather, it draws on the audience, in, draws the audience inward to share a private interior world. The monoliths uh, are each dedicated to revolutionaries, philosophers, theologians, and pop culture, featuring the likes of Gandhi, Che Guevara, The Beatles, Dylan Thomas, and Mother Teresa, among others. It's a site for contemplation and education, but it was put to practical use too. Local children invented a game, throwing a ball through the gaps between the slabs to hit the central hub. And the work contains a secret message for those adventurous enough to clamber up to read the dedication, crediting all the contributors on the tallest slab on the top. Largest, uh, even the uh, planned new towns continue to evolve. And in the past decade, some works have been relocated 
and painted. And the largest of these was Heritage, originally, sorry, I've gone too far, uh, originally a site-specific response to a local community authority uh, office block that it stood before, a group of 14 columns arranged to echo the L shape of the building. The columns comprise modular concrete segments in the style of various concrete cultures. Uh, the, but it was removed in 2011, despite the artist's protest process, uh, when the uh, building was demolished. Heritage was intended as a critique of the soulless office block monolith that it stood before, a persistent rejoinder to the generic glass and concrete face of authority. On a site visit with myself, the artist did relent that the present location overlooking the park and the Lomond Hills was pleasing, though he still views the uh, he still views the um, removal of the work and the painting of other works as uh, vandalism. The ludic quality is ever present, as you can see in the previous slide, in this slide with uh, adults and children alike. Poetry was another strand of Harding's collaborative practice, which led him to cast a short series of verses in concrete slabs to be positioned around the town, various intervals, bus stops, and local shopping centres. Poetry Path was a collaboration with Glen Rothes poet and resident Alan Bold. Living in the town, Harding was aware of the difference between uh, the um, what they call uh, the desire lines and uh, the planners' more angular paths. Harlick proposed that Bold should share, uh, provide a poem to set into paving slabs to be read in one direction, uh, the first verse in one direction, the second in another. The rural sculpture of Ian Hamilton Findlay's Little Sparta project provides a contemporaneous example of poetry and sculpture in landscape in contrast to the new town's urban setting, which explores the low density housing and interstitial green space to, for similarly unexpected places for art. Over in East Kilbride, Stanley Bonner's tenure as town artist was marked by a lack of support for the development corporation who never gave Bonner a permanent studio space. As the first new town in Scotland, a great deal had already been built before the artist arrived and his work was made more difficult by having to find opportunities within a pre-existing plan from which the architects were reluctant to deviate. Keith Donnelly had been David Harding's last assistant in Glenrothes and went on to follow Bonner as East Kilbride town artist, completing monumental artworks in traditional and modern materials, which remain in robust condition. Town artist Dennis Barnes in Livingston had been assistant at Brian Miller in Cumbernauld before moving to, uh, there in, uh, to Livingston in 1974, working with a supportive planning department and taking a lead from Glen Rothes, and focusing on, <coughs> excuse me, play sculpture. This reflected the planning regulations at the time. Uh, and like Harding, Dennis Barnes employed assistants, several of whom, Maurice McGuire and Kenny Monroe, went on to enjoy successful careers elsewhere. The outstanding work from Livingston was the wave wall pedestrian area, designed as a transition zone between town centre and residential areas. Uh, and working with uh, poet and artist Ian Hamilton Finlay uh, and Dennis Barnes' stainless steel abstract sculpture and onward towards the Riverside Green Space, see the old men of Hoy. Sadly, little else of the town artist era remains, such as the trim course, due to vandalism, changing tastes, although many other artworks have been added in subsequent, subsequent decades. Only Irvine Development Corporation decided against the town artist model, belatedly opting instead for a series of artist residencies between 79 and 89, and graduate commissions with the Scottish Arts Council funding, which produced a less ambitious series of works and underlines perhaps the importance of embedding the artist within a design team from the start of a project to move beyond mere decoration. Experimental practice of David Harding and other town's artists and associates began a process of engaging communities with their environment and contemporary art and in turn proved influential on projects that followed. Glen Rothes Harding had initiated a an annual graduate placement scheme with his assistants in which they developed their critical thinking and their own designs. The Harding effect and an experience of inspiration on charismatic mentor motivated most of his assistants to forge careers in the realms of public art elsewhere. Bonner and Donnelly and East Kilbride, as we have seen, Simon Jones became town artist in England's first new town, Stevenage, Hugh Graham works on community projects in Glasgow, and others worked in Dundee. A lineage was established whereby the flowering of public art in the new towns produced seeds that were carried elsewhere in Scotland and beyond, from beginnings in London and variations in the southeast and Peter Lee to Cumbernauld, 
and then Glenrothes and Livingstone in, at least in the early years and onward via a network of artist assistants and later through the environmental art course at Glasgow School of Art, which David Harding set up. The arrival of the Conservative government in 1979 signaled a change for the new town artists. Dennis Barnes established a private company, Town Art Limited, to provide contract work for Livingstone and Glasgow, where his generic work proved popular with Glasgow Parks Department and equally popular with the Glasgow Vandals, none of which survives. Barnes drift away from site-specific and community-oriented practice towards commercial production began the slow decline of town art. Brian Miller found less opportunity for public art and his attention shifted towards theatre. East Kilbride uh, switched to occasional commissions. David Harding was succeeded at Glenrothes by Malcolm Robertson as town artist, who continued until the early 90s, and his, less, his somewhat less challenging work remains popular. Harding himself moved into education, first at Dartington College in Devon, before establishing the environmental art course at Glasgow in 1985, where he cultivated the next generation of prize-winning Scottish artists such as Douglas Gordon, Christine Borland and Nathan Coley. Before his retirement in 2001, Harding had succeeded in distilling his town artist experience into a pedagogic practice that enabled young artists to make new kinds of public art and collaborative practice to extend the trajectory that he'd begun in Glenrothes. Sadly, little of the older Cumbernauld Cumbernau town art survives due to the fugitive nature of some work. More work survives in Livingston and East Kilbride, and there remains a great deal in Glenrothes. It's encouraging that all of the new towns have continued to add to their public art collections, often incorporating community art projects, allowing the residents to contribute to their own environment. But there is concern that work from the town artist period is in danger of neglect. The new town artworks are of a post-war urban social history. And there are many examples where works have become part of the identity of towns and neighborhoods. For works located in residential areas, away from town centers or roundabouts, it's easy for them to become overlooked and neglected, yet they represent a genius loci of the spirit of place that forms part of the material history of new towns. A few outstanding works have been listed, but most lack such protection and are subject to reciting or repainting or removal with little or no public consultation. Since the transfer of new town development, the transfer of power from new town development corporations to local councils began in the 1980s, responsibility for the upkeep of public art mostly resides with local authorities who have dwindling resources and rising priorities. The rediscovery of local sculpture can be coupled with educating communities about their unique assets and promoting an understanding that these works are worthy of preservation. In this pandemic year, when movement has been so limited, what can be better? Than having an artwork on your doorstep. Thank you. Thank you. That was that was terrific, Andrew, and and perfectly to time. Absolutely, um, absolutely That's a miracle. <laughs> Not a miracle at all. <laughs> and uh, you know, lots of lots of questions. I'm sure we've already had one specific one, but we have to wait um, till that halfway uh, point of our session. So. Um, Moving on now to our second paper, um, this is given by Kate Harding, who is Artistic Director of the Harlow Art Trust, and she's lead, leading this organisation to achieve its vision of creating Harlow Sculpture Town as a unique urban sculpture park developed with and for the community, and this is the topic of her, her presentation today. So over to you, Kate. Thank you. Okay, I hope everybody can um, can hear me and and see the presentation fine. Um, so yes, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am the artistic director of Harlow Art um, Harlow Sculpture Town, which is an initiative um, run by Harlow Art Trust. So um, our involvement with Art UK stretches back to 2018, um, when Art UK volunteers were busy documenting our public sculpture as part of their digitization project. Um, and Harlow's was fortunate enough to be one of the first collections to go live on the Art UK website. Um, and in 2019, we also participated um, in the fantastic Masterpieces in School program. Uh, and Katie discussed that a little bit this morning. Um, so really this afternoon, um, I am just going to cover the genesis 
the collection um, account for some of the connections between sculpture and the communities um, and explain our, uh, our approach to curation. Um, and in the process, I will take you on a bit of a walk through Harlow Sculpture Town. Um, so what you're seeing here is a screenshot taken from our digital map, which we launched um, last year in 2020. Um, and um, I, I, I just said previously that I will, I will try to account for some of the connections between sculpture and communities. And, and that's for a good reason that I think this slide illustrates quite well um, with a collection of over 100 sculptures spread across the 30 kilometer area, which is itself uh, a living, breathing town um, with a population of 80,000 people, there are going to be myriad connections between people and sculpture that, um, that we don't know about, that will always be unknowable um, and are just part of the personal um, geographies of people who live and work um, alongside the sculptures. Um, and that, that's part of its um, enduring power, uh, I think. Um, so Harlow is not a typical sculpture park by any means, um, it doesn't have the visitor experience in mind necessarily, um, in fact many of the works are kind of uh, are actually <laughs> downright uh, inaccessible um, to the average sculpture seeker. Um, however, uh, in and amongst um, the 101, the collection contains artwork by arguably some of the greatest artists um, of the 20th century, and that's including um, Rodin, uh, Henry Moore, Barbara Hepworth, uh, Lynn Chadwick, and a few. Um, seven of the works are, are now grade two listed. Um, so on, on the left here, I'm showing Contrapuntal Forms, which is by um, Barbara Hepworth. We actually saw that in Andrew's presentation um, uh, cited on the south bank of the Festival of Britain, and that was where it was um, originally commissioned for Harlow Development Corporation acquired it after the close of the festival. Um, on the right, um, that is Trigon by the sculptor Lynn Chadwick, which um, came to the town in 1961. Um, so uh, the majority of the collection can be found outdoors, um, accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, about 60% of the sculptures are owned by Harlow Art Trust, 30% by Harlow Council, um, and a further 10% by NHS Trust, schools and, and local businesses in the area. Um, so how did such a collection come to be? Um, well, uh, Again, I mean, like Glen Rathis um, and, and the other new towns that Andrew has just spoken about, the initial idea for starting the collection um, came about with the genesis of the new town movement um, itself. Um, so, um, Sir Frederick Gibbard, um, who's pictured here, um, I'm, I'm showing him also with his wife, um, um, Patricia, who he met when she was a town councillor. Um, and who herself became a really influential, influential member of the, um, of the first trust. Um, and they, they later married and settled in, in Harlow for the rest of their lives. Um, but Sir Frederick Gibbard, um, he was appointed master planner um, and uh, insisted on the development of um, mixed housing schemes, which incorporated houses, flats, maisonettes within planned landscapes and integrated communal spaces. Um, building began in 1951. By 1952, the town had a population of 5,571. Um, uh, but by 1956, that had grown to 37,000. So um, really, uh, really quite quick. Um, Gibbard was, um, he was uncompromising from the beginning that high quality art should be cited for Harlow's communal spaces. Um, and he claimed that it had been his uh, trips to Florence um, that had inspired him to, um, to quote, uh, source the finest works of art for Harlow Town Centre. Um, so here I'm, I'm showing you a picture, quite small, um, of the Loggia de Lanzi, um, an open air sculpture gallery of antique and Renaissance works um, in the Piazza della Signoria in Florence, uh, including Michelangelo's David, which you can just see bottom left. Um, and then on the left is a drawing by Gibbard, which is taken from his book, um, The Design of Harlow. Uh, again, not sure how easy it is to see, but you can see a kind of impression of, a, of an equestrian statue here um, and an indoor and outdoor sculpture gallery with um, works in a, in a kind of classical style. Um, so by 1951, the Harlow Development Corporation um, had 
already started bringing sculptures to the town. Um, the first commission was um, this one here, which is um, called Chiron Teaching the Young Hero by um, Mary Spencer Watson. Um, and she was commissioned to create this for the coronation of um, Elizabeth II. Um, and it, Gibbard's correspondence with the artist gives um, a, a good insight into the thinking behind it. Um, he wrote to her, um, we do not know what the sculpture should be, but it is felt that in some way it should try to express the community idea. The little square is the focus for community life in the area. Um, so in response, um, Spencer Watson chose to depict the figure of Chiron um, from Greek mythology. Um, Chiron is a centaur whose ability as a teacher of many different arts um, drew uh, pupils far and wide. Um, and she would, she would write that um, Chiron's cave, she felt, was surely an early um, form of community centre. Uh, legend has it that she, she parked her caravan by the intended site and emerged each day to carve directly into Portland stone um, until the sculpture appeared. Um, so that was the very first commission for the town. Um, but interestingly, it, it wasn't Gibbard, but uh, well, it wasn't Gibbard himself, but it was um, Morris Ash, who was chairman of the council at the time um, and also an executive of the Town and Country Planning Association, um, who first advanced the idea of an art trust um, to build the collection further. Um, Ash invited uh, his friend Philip Hendy, um, who was then the director of the National Gallery, to be its first chairman. Um, and with a grant of £250 from Dartington Hall Trust, um, in 1953, they, they got going. Um, and as a trustee, um, Gibbard set out exactly the kind of environment that he hoped to achieve, which was, um, which was one in which, I'm quoting here, one in which the creative arts are to be valued and given an important role. Um, in the community. Um, so in keeping with this vision, lots of the early sculptures were cited outside libraries, uh, common rooms, community halls, um, and also agreement was sought um, from local residents where they were already um, living in Harlow. Um, so um, the Trust built the collection in two major ways. Um, one of these was um, just through acquisitions um, and they relied heavily on good connections um, and the generosity of artists uh, to bring sculptures to the town. Um, I always think it's, it's sort of um, worth noting um, that unlike other new town collections, so far as I can tell, um, these acquisitions included works that preceded the contemporary moment. Um, so on the left, um, there's a, it's the Roman head, um, which is now unfortunately lost. Um, in the middle, it's that, that work by um, Rodin, Eve, um, which was completed in 1882. Um, and on the right, um, a Madonna and child sculpture made by an unknown artist in the 16th century, which is, um, which is now in uh, uh, St. Paul's Church in the town centre. Um, of course, the other main way of um, building the collection up um, was commissioning, um, and um, they commissioned both well and lesser known artists of the time. Um, on the right here, um, this is the monumental meat porters by, by Ralph Brown, which is dated 1957. Um, so born in Leeds in 1928, uh, Brown is considered the younger contemporary of that sort of eminent group of uh, Yorkshire sculptures, sculptors that um, include Hepworth, uh, Moore and also Kenneth Armitage. Um, and the smaller work of his sheep shearer had been purchased by the trust in 1955 um, while Brown was studying at the Royal College of Art. So again, quite similar to the Scottish Newtowns, um, work was acquired from artists or, or um, artists were working with councils um, who were quite early in, in their career. Um, so um, off the back of the success of sheep shearer, the trust commissioned um, meat porters for the market square. Um, and it's widely considered Brown's most significant piece um, and um, is based on um, studies of bummeries, which is a term um, for porters whose job it was to haul meat carcasses at Smithfield Market in London. Um, and Brown hoped that um, the subject would resonate um, with the people of Harlow Newtown, many of whom would have moved from, from East and Northeast London um, and might have been familiar with such scenes or even known or, or have been um, porters themselves. Um, and then on the left, um, 
uh, which we've, we've also seen today, I think already. Um, this is one of the most well-known works in, in the collection. It's Henry Moore's Harlow Family Group, which was commissioned in 1953. Um, and, and Moore's initial idea was um, to make a group rather more than life size, con uh, conceived on, on human and classical lines. Um, and he had kind of, he, he could hardly have chosen a more appropriate subject. Um, uh, just a, a prospectus published by BP uh, in 1964 titled Moving to Harlow um, advertises the town as the perfect place to raise a family. Um, it says that it's it was the safest place in the country for children and old people um, and there were um, opportunities for working wives as well. Um, and but so by this time um, Harlow had been nick nicknamed uh, Pram Town um, by the press uh, on account of its uh, really booming, quite booming population. Um, so um, the relationship between residents and Harlow family group is particularly well documented. Um, it has always attracted people to to augment the family. Um, there's a quite a charming excerpt from um, a report by the Daily Telegraph on the day of its unveiling. Um, which which reads that um, within an hour of its unveiling, the family had already entered into the life of Harlow. Small boys were getting up on the pedestal, clambering over the woman, taking occupation on the empty space in the man's lap. At one moment, indeed, the family of three had expanded to one of seven. Um, and that there are countless photos, such as the ones I'm showing here, and um, both of which come from from personal collections. Um, the the one on the left is a, a long time um, volunteer with a bars, um, and so the sculpture has has played an important role in the lives of um, local children and indeed adults as as an object of play. Um, rumors spread for instance amongst um, youngsters in the 50s and 60s that the sculpture was still somehow growing um, and there were also reports of children um, bringing the figures a drink of water um, on hot days. Um, so obviously as these pictures illustrate even though the trust uh, had um, justifiable concerns um, uh, about the vulnerability of the work um, from the beginning. Um, they resisted suggestions uh, to erect railings um, or otherwise kind of physically protect the sculpture um, pretty much until um, that was um, no longer tenable. Um, so um, the head of the child figure had been knocked off once, knocked off a second time, lost and recovered by public reward um, by the mid 1980s. Um, and after that point, the trust um, and the council did see fit to move the work indoors to the ground floor of um, Harlow Civic Centre where it still resides today. Um, Nonetheless, it still um, kind of has the capacity to go wandering, um, animated in different ways as a sign and a, and a symbol for the town. Um, uh, it's often been used as an unofficial um, emblem and has, is a work of art that somehow come to signify um, the spirit of Harlow um, in, in many different ways. Um, and I think it speaks well to the ways that residents also invest sculptures with meaning um, over time. Um, so on the left uh, here is the family group kind of um, enlivened as responsible Harlow citizens caring for their town by disposing of litter. Um, the image of the middle um, is a flyer made by the Harlow Action Group um, for the World Nuclear Disarmament Campaign. Um, and then on the right, uh, much more recently, a member of uh, Harlow Young Labour holds a banner um, with a screen print of the sculpture um, at its centre on a march in London, um, I believe that was in 2019. Um, Harlow has historically had a strong um, anti-war and pacifist tradition. Um, for which other works have also been in uh, been mobilised, um, and this is uh, not an, not an anger by Leon Underwood, who was actually a teacher of Moore's um, at one time. Um, Underwood had dreamed of this work as a giant um, anti-war memorial standing on a clifftop um, above Dover. It was first cast in in the 1920s when the the clenched fist with the thumb enclosed. By the fingers would have been instantly recognizable um, to, to many people as a gesture of peace um, and, and symbol of solidarity with people suffering in the Spanish Civil War. Um, 
And um, in 2016, um, it also became a focal point for the for the vigil of um, a local man, Eric Juzvik, um, whose uh, whose killing was widely and wrongly interpreted at the time um, as racially motivated in the wake of, a, of the Brexit vote. Um, so in many ways, the sculptures have been used and continue to be used as a focal point for various kinds of activities, um, solitary, communal, personal, political, cultural, um, and a sort of mix of all of those things um, together. Um, the pictures I'm just showing now are some, some recent examples. Um, this was a sketch uh, by a local artist, Jordan Cook, um, uh, who kind of busied himself during lockdown last year, um, sketching uh, uh, some of the works in, in the collection. Um, this is an image of our uh, Art UK masterpieces in Schools Day when um, Cat by Jane Aykroyd um, went to um, local primary schools. It was a, it was a fantastic success. Um, and also, I mean, it's not just, uh, it's not just the trust that cares for the work. Um, Organized groups of, of local experts and enthusiasts um, have also kind of banded together um, to support the conservation of the collection for future generations. Um, so this is a, um, a cycle tour which is led by um, the Friends of Harlow Sculpture Town um, and they have a set of excellent tours. Um, that um, kind of can introduce people to a collection that can, um, as I've kind of described before, be quite uh, daunting to explore as a first time visitor. Um, uh, as an example um, of a work that's particularly challenging to find, um, uh, this is Donkey, which, um, you know, in, it will, even in spite of the challenge, it was voted the town's favorite sculpture um, as part of its 70th anniversary uh, celebrations in, in uh, 2017. Um, it's situated in the middle of a small communal lawn um, within, within a rather like a uh, labyrinthine residential area. Um, and it's notoriously evasive, um, even for people who live really locally. Um, so um, with this in mind, I'm just going to finish off by explaining how um, at Harlow Art Trust today, we're working to curate and present the collection um, to make it more accessible than it's been before. Um, so we launched our website, as I mentioned um, uh, last year, um, Sculpture Town UK indexes and provides detail on every sculpture, um, including those that have been lost. Um, and we also created three new trails of varying lengths, taking in different aspects of the town um, and a good proportion of the sculptures on view, but by no means all of them. Um, we also redesigned our paper map and our guide, um, which will shortly be distributed to schools, local businesses, um, community and cultural organisations. Um, and we have also been um, really grateful to Harlow Council for supporting the, the creation of a whole set of signs for all of 101 um, artworks. Um, in the early days, the trust were really diligent, um, signing everything consistently, um, but inevitably um, with changes to trustees and conventions and, and aesthetics, um, this kind of fell by the wayside. Um, and until recently, much of the collection was uh, inconsistently or, or, or not identified at all. Um, however, when, um, when you do all make it to Harlow, when it's okay to do so, um, you'll find each sculpture named, dated and numbered in the order um, in which they were commissioned um, or acquired for the town. Um, and again, so this is uh, not in anger, which we saw before, number 43, the 43rd uh, sculpture to be added to the collection. Um, and just my last point is really to say that um, our kind of job as commissioners is, is by no means um, over. We still bring new works to the town um, through our, our artisan residence scheme and by working with developers um, on their public art um, requirements and deliver those in a way that's sort of sensitive to Harlow's special sculptural heritage. Um, Harlow is also um, just about to expand um, 16,500 new homes um, within the next 20 years. So we've got a large but incredibly exciting task um, on our hands to, to grow the collection, um, much like the in the earlier days of rapid expansion and facilitate um, a new legacy of contemporary public sculpture that really sort of speaks to our present moment, but that will also last um, sort of 70 years uh, in the future. Um, so 
Uh, thank you very much for listening and, um, and I hope to welcome you to Harlow Sculpture Town in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thank you again for another wonderfully rich paper and one that, that, that uh, fits so well with our first paper with Andrews. I think there are questions coming up which actually address both papers, so I will leave you, I think, to decide on the first one, um, which it comes from Murad Cross. And, and she asks, did the new town residents have an input or did they take what they were given? That is, did they prefer abstract or representational sculpture? I remember seeing abstract wall sculptures in the 1960s in Cumbernauld and being puzzled by what they were. Um, well, that sounds like a, a Scottish new town question. Um, <laughs> Uh, Cumbernauld, yes. I mean, I think I may have shown one of the uh, pieces she refers to in Cumbernauld, um, uh, which is uh, bears a remarkable resemblance to um, some of the earlier William Mitchell, Anthony Holloway work in London. So I think uh, the artists were keeping an eye on what each other were doing. Um, the Cumbernauld work initially would have been mostly by the town artist Brian Miller, rather than the community. Um, and... Uh, that it was quite different to the situation in Glen Rothes, where, as I sort of illustrated, David Harding was much more of a collaborative practice. And um, although he he sort of begins by working with the, uh, the the architects, the engineers, and the construction workers themselves, um, he does. There's a point at which he he usually steps away, and that's in the, the naming of the artworks. So. Most of the works in the residential districts uh, will have names that the community themselves have, have given to them, and uh, they became reference points in in what were what remain, I guess, but were certainly initially were, were quite stark and repetitive landscapes. So if somebody could say "Meet you by the hippos" or, or "Meet you by some, something else," then that that was um, a, a geographical location um, that became more of a kind of uh, identity, I guess one would say, for, for these uh, various little districts within the town and for the town as a whole. Um, as far as abstract and represent representational sculpture is concerned, um, uh, the town artists didn't really talk down to their audience. They, they, if they weren't living in the new towns, they were spending a lot of time there. Um, and so they're, they're quite happy to offer a bit of both. Um, and uh, I think it was at a time when um, modern art or what looked like modern art perhaps was more challenging uh, to its audience. So um, this, this was quite uh, an experimental practice from the get-go. Um, and I think that um, the, the communities um, rose to that and, and embraced it. Thank you. Um, did you want to say anything about that, Kate, uh, about the, that particular issue? about um, the involvement of the community in choosing or selecting? Um, I think, um, I suppose, what, just to that point about kind of the abstract versus the representational, um, <laughs> in Harlow, there's a there's a lovely story about, um, that relates to contrapuntal forms, um, which at the time as a kind of monumental sculpture that wasn't figurative, didn't um, represent anybody, would have been um, really, really quite contemporary. Um, there's a really lovely quote from um, from a newspaper from a from a resident called Mrs. Merle who who um, says you know um, in in Harlow we're all contemporary we have modern houses and we we have modern art too um, so yes. it, it's um, but but then again that's not to say that it was just um, I mean I, that, that there's evidence for um, with the first commission. Uh, Gibbard saying, um, you know, it's not it actually, it would be better to have a representational work. We've already got an abstract piece. Um, so there was a kind of, it, it, perhaps a, kind of a bit of a balancing act. So, so uh, a bit of everything. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we've got about another minute before we have to go on to the next paper. And I just wondered um, if you, you might both, both think about this very big question, but perhaps answer quite briefly uh, from Dawn Pereira. How has local response to the artworks changed during lockdowns? Um, well, may I go first? Um, I, I, yes. It's, um, it's a slightly awkward one to answer because I, I haven't been able to go there myself very much. <laughs> no. um, but I, I, I would go on a few um, interactions that I, that I have had. And um, 
uh, I think it's, it's actually provided a moment for people to re reflect on their locality. Um, everybody's been uh, confined to the same sort of area and um, it, it's been an opportunity to um, look at perhaps what is usually overlooked, uh, okay. what, what one um, is perhaps over familiar with living in a town for a long time. Um, uh, you, you pass by these things every day and um, spending a, some time moving at a different pace. And you're not scurrying to work or getting in your car, you, you're, you're, you're walking around a bit more. Um, I, I think mm. it's been very positive. Great. Kate, do you want to just say very briefly anything about that? Likewise, um, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd just echo what what Andrew is saying, but um, but also, I mean, I've been I've been stuck outside of Harlow as well, so <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been able to enjoy it myself. No. Well, that's great. Thank you both. And I, there are questions coming up about play, and about um, obviously which interact with the notion of schools and playgrounds and players which you brought up, and and I think we'll start we'll be able to address some of those questions again right at the end after the next two okay. papers but thank you both of you enormously for two fantastic papers which have started us off so well and uh, we're now going to press on with the next two papers and uh, I'm very very pleased to be able to introduce Leila Bloom who is curator at the University of Leeds art collection and the Stanley and Audrey Burton Gallery. She's been involved in several major sculpture commissions for the campus and her topic this afternoon is curating the campus new directions. Over to you Leila. Thank you Alison, let me just get my presentation up. Right, I, I hope you can hear me. I think there was a bit of muting back and forth. Um, do come on and tell me if you can't hear or see me. Um, yes, Curating Leeds Campus. Over the past few decades, there's been both an explosion of commissioning of sculpture and an associated critique. In recent years, scholars have explored questions about artworks commissioned by civic and corporate bodies and for healthcare setting. Um, um, UK university campuses have also seen a renaissance in public art commissioning. The reasons for this renaissance are similar to those for other public art commissions. Placemaking, widening audiences and participation, the well-being of students and staff, and fostering student and staff rec recruitment and retention. But the meaning of public art on campus has its own particular character. This meaning is also continually changing in response to the shifting needs of the university. In the light of the COVID-19 crisis, this situation is set to change again, perhaps dramatically. A year ago, in March 2020, Hans Ulrich Obrist, um, Artistic Director of the Serpentine, called for a major government-funded public art response to the COVID-19 crisis. He declared that the crisis demanded that museums find ways to go beyond their walls to reach everyone. In this context, the Art UK sculpture project could not be more timely. Digital engagement has been crucial to connecting with audiences during the crisis, and it will continue to be essential for arts organizations in the future. How will this affect the production and engagement with sculpture? The University of Leeds provides an ideal case study to illustrate the current situation for public art on campuses. Its public art collection, which dates back to 1923, has been constantly evolving since then. Using artworks from this collection, I propose to explore the changing purpose and meaning of public art on the university campus, and to ask, how will this change again in a post-COVID world? As a curator of the University of Leeds Art Collection, I have the honor to care for some three and a half thousand artworks. These include artworks, sorry, these uh, include a strong and growing public art collection. The university's first public commission, a frieze entitled Christ Driving the Money Changes for the, from the Temple by Eric Gill, was commissioned by Vice Chancellor Sir Michael Sadler as a memorial to the fallen of the First World War. What might have been a traditional commemorative sculpture actually launched a lively debate about the meaning of art when it was unveiled in 1923. Sadler, who was Vice Chancellor at Leeds from 1911 to 1923, was a remarkable teacher, passionate about the value and transformational effect of education. He was also a serious art collector and displayed his personal collection of early English watercolours, post-impressionist and English modernist works within the university buildings. 
he liked to show old and new works beside each other to encourage students to compare and discuss artistic developments. When he retired, Sadler left an important group of these artworks to the university. This was an incredible legacy which helped establish the university art collection and give it a contemporary character going forwards. The War Memorial Freeze by Eric Gill was contentious in 1923 because of its subject matter. The gospel story of Christ driving the money changers from the temple was not a typical theme for a memorial. It was intended as a moral commentary on the war. Gill depicted the fleeing money changers in contemporary dress, leading the retreat as a woman stuffing money into her handbag, followed closely by her husband, identified as a pawnbroker. The biblical verse carved around the scene translates as, Go to now, you rich men, weep and howl in your miseries, which shall come upon you. Your riches are putrid. Even before its unveiling, a heated debate uh, about the freeze had erupted in the local press. Correspondents described the work as bizarre, puzzling, strange, and not appropriate. Local pawnbrokers were especially indignant. The Pawnbrokers Gazette denounced it as a tasteless and tactless parody. Sadler defended the commission, arguing that the frieze depicted a Christian view of war and the work was one of the finest things in modern art. Despite strong opposition from many quarters, Sadler stood by the artwork. He declared that the carving will tell its own tale. It was therefore dedicated without incident on the exterior of the Great Hall in 1923. Though the war memorial was not universally loved, and indeed a later vice chancellor disliked it so much he instructed the gardeners to grow ivy over it, it certainly set a trend at least for public art that could provoke debate. The university's public art collection truly took off, however, with the commission of man-made fibres by Mitzi Cunliffe in 1956, here seen atop uh, the Clothworker South building now. Mitzi Cunliffe is best known today for her design of the BAFTA award mask. This glamorous American sculptor was chosen as one of only six women sculptors for the Festival of Britain in 1951. Her eight foot tall work in cement, uh, root bodied forth, was placed at the Waterloo entrance of the festival. Sadly, it is no longer extant like so many other major works from the festival, which were not designed for longevity. The bronze maquette, however, is held by Leeds Museums and Galleries and of course is now visible on, online at Art UK. Following the festival, Cunliffe's new man-made fibers building was a highlight. To adorn this new center for synthetic textiles, Cunliffe proposed a cat's cradle of hands holding threads woven together as if by a loom carved in Portland stone. She was worried about the artwork's impact, positioned atop the building, and suggested it be gilded to be more visible. Unfortunately, the building's architect quashed this idea, suggesting that a gilded sculpture might blind people on sunny days. For Cunliffe, it was important that people could engage with her sculpture physically. In 1950, she wrote that sculpture must again be made accessible. In other words, removed from galleries and placed outdoors. It should be, as she said, taken for granted by people as part of the natural environment, the stuff of life. She said she wanted her work to be used, rained on, leaned against. Though Cunliffe sculpture for Leeds cannot unfortunately be leaned against, her work and her approach inspired a host of other artistic creations. Among these is another public artwork, a celebration of engineering sciences, designed by Alan Johnson, who was actually one of the architects with Lanchester and Lodge who had worked with Cunliffe on the man-made fibres building. This artwork is constructed of lightweight and therefore cost-effective glass fiber reinforced polyester rather than Portland stone. It enables the frieze to float around the exterior of the auditorium of the mechanical engineering building with forms echoing um, Cunliffe's style. In 2016, to mark the 60th anniversary of Cunliffe sculpture, the university mounted a year long Yorkshire Year of the Textile Programme with support from Arts Council England. Over that year, Cunliffe sculpture inspired new poetry commissions, com community canopies, talks, dance performances, and even knitting workshops. Several new art commissions were initiated, both temporary and permanent. Sue Lottie's stone carving um, uh, was placed, uh, sorry, her stone carving texta Texans was in the pavement in front of the building, specifically designed to draw attention to Cunliffe's work overhead 
ensuring that it would be noticed. One of the most beloved works on campus is Quentin Bell's work, Levitating Woman, The Dreamer. It was commissioned through Stanley Burton, a local businessman, a long-term patron of the university and his art collection. Burton had offered funds to purchase a work from Bell, who had been the first professor of fine art at Leeds. Quentin Bell suggested an ambitious, larger-than-life sculpture of a floating woman, a recurrent motif in his work, inspired by a conjurer's trick that he had witnessed as a young child. The fabrication of this floating figure, however, posed some technical challenge, and so Burton and Bell turned to the Civil Engineering Department for advice. Dr. Gurdiv Singh developed the complicated steel armature required to make the sculpture appear to float with an outer shell of fiberglass. Initially, the work was installed so that it soared over a void space at the Edward Boyle Library. When the building was renovated, the sculpture was relocated to Cloth Workers Court, where it now floats over a garden of textile dyeing plants. More recent examples of collaboration between artists and scientists on campus include Simon Fujiwara's Aspire and Sarah Barker's The Worlds of If. Fujiwara's column for the Laidlaw Library was designed as a skyward archaeology reflecting the history of research on campus. From the coal dust covered base representing the university's early relationship with the textile industry, the column goes upwards through rusty bricks and mechanical cables to finally terminate in green biological forms. This marriage of the digital and biological came out of discussions with various researchers on campus. Sarah Barker's The Worlds of If is the newest public artwork on campus, erected in 2020 uh, on the WH Bragg Building. The Bragg Building, named for Nobel Prize winning physicist and X-ray crystallographer WH Bragg, brings together scientists from several scientific disciplines, from engineering, astronomy, physics and computing, with the aim of encouraging interdisciplinary cross collaboration. Barker's designs aim to reflect this collaboration with strands and scientific symbols woven together like a textile. In a nod to X-ray crystallography, Bragg's equation runs through the sculpture. Barker worked closely with the scientists at the Bragg building to develop this design, including exploring formulations for the iridescent paint. Lillian Lynn's revolving illuminated poem drum converse column for the Nexus building is another example of collaboration with researchers and students on campus. Lynn has long been interested in freeing words from the linearity of syntax in a physical way by moving them within her poem drum creations. For this work, Lynn invited students and staff to contribute texts on the theme of interchange, invention, and creation. This is highly appropriate for the Nexus building where researchers collaborate with business and industry professionals. Lynn then selected elements of these textual submissions, which were laser cut out of two counter revolving aluminium drums. The ever changing colorful LED light display is a beacon to the rest of the city of Leeds. Keith Wilson's A Sign for Art realizes Cunliffe's wish for artwork to be leaned against. Set in the center of Beech Grove Plaza in the heart of campus, a sign for art, Stelle 2014, reproduces on a grand scale the motion that Wilson used when he was an art instructor for deafblind adults. Drawing two spaced fingertips in a wave motion across the forehead of the student, a tactile brainwave sign, announced the arrival of the artist, the subject of art, and the imminent activity of making art, Wilson recalled. This form had always remained with the artist and the commission offered him the opportunity to render it on a large scale. Originally proposed as a bronze sculpture, referring to the Yorkshire region's renowned sculptors, Barbara Hepworth and Henry Moore, Wilson was constrained by the budget to produce a sculpture in cast polyurethane elastomer. This somewhat flexible material is tough enough to be used for open ocean um, buoys. Wilson experimented with the casting and found that he could achieve a wavy texture by spinning the cast sections whilst they were drying. You can see an image below that process. The result is that this sculpture invites people to caress it and to move around and within it. Wilson purposely designed the sculpture so that people can move 
uh, through it, but with some entertaining wiggling about. So the sculpture thus directly affects um, how they move. People smile when they interact with the sculpture. The work has certainly won the hearts of students since it was installed in 2014. It's become the most recognizable and iconic public artwork on campus. As such, its image now graces the gallery's new tote bag. A starting point for lively debate, an inspiration for wider campus creativity, collaboration with researchers and students, and physical engagement with audiences. These themes have been and will continue to be important in the future for public art at Leeds. But we need to meet new challenges. The University of Leeds public art strategy was ratified in 2015. Its vision is for public art to become an integrated part of both the intellectual landscape and the built environment of the University of Leeds. This will be achieved through an inspirational, integrated and connected public art program, setting a standard that can become a benchmark for public art in higher education nationally and internationally enabling the university to take a leading role in 21st century public art practice. The three strategic strands of the strategy you see here are connecting up and communicating, developing and promoting a legible platform for public art at Leeds, public art and research, creating an internationally significant program of public art commissioning and research practice, and programming the campus creating the context for presenting high quality public art in the university's public realm. After COVID-19, budgets will be tighter. And so making this vision a reality will require greater creativity. Collaborations with locations and festivals, such as Yorkshire Sculpture International and Leeds 2023, will certainly be more important than ever. Tighter budgets might also mean more temporary and ephemeral commissions. Though these can be packaged together with annual themes for audiences, as we saw with the Yorkshire Year of the Textile. The public art sector is headed towards more integration with audiences, more immersive experiences, and towards greater interactivity. Can this be digi digital? Sorry. Digital innovation is one element that we haven't yet explored in regard to, to the public art collection at Leeds. It could be a new fourth strand for a renewed strategy in 2021. We lay the foundations for this with the digitization of our sculpture collections, shared now um, via Art UK and other aggregators, and thus, as we've seen with the talks today, um, productively linked with other national collections. Work has also enabled an online public art trail, um, also available as a layer on the interactive campus map, similar to Harlow. Um, however, augmented reality and virtual reality technologies promise richer public engagement experiences with existing collections and the possibility of entirely virtual sculpture projects. In 2019, the University of Northampton launched a fully virtual sculpture trail of student works on its campus using um, AR technology. And internationally renowned artists like Olafur Eliasson and Cause have created virtual artworks for Acute Art, which is an uh, AR art app. Existing digital platforms can also be repurposed for new artwork concepts. At the end of 2020, Hansel Rigobris, perhaps responding to his own call to action last March, delivered a public art project via Instagram posts entitled Do It Home. This group show included over 50 different artists' instructions issued via Instagram posts for the followers to undertake at home. One digital project that we're hoping to realize um, with further fundraising is Katrina Palmer's The Time Traveling Circus, a public artwork for the Brotherton Library on campus. Palmer's concept was shortlisted by the Contemporary Art Society um, for its annual prize, and they've also since helped us buy the artist sketches and artist book connected to the project for the collection. Palmer's artwork takes the form of an audio tour where the sculpture or sculptural installation is actually created by the audience as they move through physical spaces on campus whilst listening to the audio. Palmer's audio melodrama takes their audience on a journey with the partly historical, partly fictionalized story of Pablo Fanque, also known as William Darby, who is actually buried in St. George's Field Cemetery. This 19th century cemetery now lies within the university campus bounds and the library holds its archive. Darby, who is immortalized as Mr. Kite in the song by the Beatles, was the first black circus proprietor in Britain. 
His wife, Susanna, was tragically killed in a circus accident whilst at Leeds, and he therefore chose to be buried in Leeds at her side. Realising this project would involve both students and staff at the university in its creation across different disciplines. Staff in the School of Media and Communication would be involved in the technical process of recording and audio editing. Poetry students um, and poetry fellows at the School of English would engage with Palmer's writing process, creating new output from their interaction with the artist. The School of Fine Art, History of Art and Cultural Studies, whose building is adjacent to this cemetery, has already invited Palmer to speak to their students for a professional practice talk and would engage its students in her art making process in a variety of ways, in particular via the School Centre for Audiovisual Experimentation, CAVE. This audio work for campus would challenge conventions for audiences of what public artwork can be and therefore make a significant contribution to the developing definition and possibilities for public art. Virtual and digital experiences must be woven into the university's strategy for public art. Curating the campus must integrate the idea of the university as a site for digital experimentation and inquiry in public art. This has been a happy week for universities as students and staff begin returning to campus following the recent lockdown. However, the process of reopening ca campus is complex and will take some time. Campus life and culture on campus will not return to its former vibrancy for many months. For those students and staff now returning to campus, this university's public art collection has the potential to contribute to their well-being, restoring a sense of place and adding value to the physical on-campus experience. And of course, after such a difficult year, one of the attractions of public art is that it's artwork that you can actually lean against. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was terrific. Um, Leila, really, really full of, full of very interesting and fascinating material, particularly, you know, I'm at Loughborough and you know, we have a an art collection which was started by Stuart Mason, really an external art collection, when he was, um, you know, education officer, those very kind of brilliant years uh, of his, his uh, time of giving part of the money for building to, uh, to putting up works of art. So it, it brought all kinds of thoughts to my mind about how we continue and, and continue that creativity on campus and how we curate it. Um, we have to. We have questions uh, after the next speaker, and I'm sure you, there will be plenty for you to um, to to get your heads around because it brings up so many questions again about the role of education and also transient audiences because students aren't there for that long. <laughs> yeah. well, they're kind of there for three, four years, possibly more, but um, it's constantly changing. So we're going on to the the our final paper. Um, I'm, I'm very, very happy to introduce my colleague at Loughborough, Michael Shaw, uh, who curates, teaches and, and makes sculptures. He's a lecturer in fine art at, at Loughborough. And since 2005, he has curated and installed annual shows at Burley House, uh, which is just outside Stamford. Each uh, of these shows consisted of being of around 20 large scale works, which is a, is a huge undertaking. And his topic for us today is curating sculpture in the landscape. Over to you, Michael. Um, right, thanks very much, Alison. Uh, thanks everybody for, um, oh, I disappeared. Somebody stopped me. Hello. <laughs> you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. <clears throat> Hi, I'm, I'm assuming you can uh, hear me because I can't see myself anymore. I've got my video running, but I think the organisers may have stopped me, but that's OK. We can hear you. OK, good. It's probably better not to. Oh, there, we, there I am. I was about to say it's better not to see me. But <laughs> um, yes, I mean, as far as sculpture goes, I will pretty much do anything. So um, but today, um, well, actually, there's some seriousness to that because I think uh, the teaching the making and the curating they all inform one another and have to done over the years um so i will uh, share my screen now and hopefully you will be able to see uh, the powerpoint 
Yeah, so hi everybody. My name's uh, Michael Shaw and I'm going to talk a little bit about my curating activities which occur at Burley House. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, it's a very large stately home. Um, they market themselves as the finest Elizabethan mansion. Now, um, that's probably not a grandizement because it is a pretty impressive place if you go and see it. And my role started, as Alison said, in 2005. Now, my predecessor was the person responsible for kind of setting up the sculpture garden because initially it was a hypothesis. Um, so the very early works tended to be in wood. Now, a lot of those are coming to the end of their natural lifespan, which also connects to some of the ideas and discussions that Andrew was talking about in terms of vandalism and perhaps the actual you know, when do you actually retire an artwork and when does it decay to the point where it's not actually valid anymore? So we have about 25 to 26 um, sculptures in the permanent collection that were all made after 1998. And as I say, that number is constantly changing as we retire some works and commission new pieces. Uh, for the most part, the pieces we're going to see today are all uh, temporary projects, and there are a few of them still remain. So I'm just going to explain a little bit about my approach to the curation, which is obviously as soon as you take sculpture outdoors, whether it's in the urban environment or a rural environment as we are, it becomes an instantly much more dynamic and animated place. You have to deal with the weather. You've got so many different variables to take on board that, uh, that you perhaps don't have to deal with when you're in the white walled gallery. So one of the things that's really important to me is to try to create uh, some kind of meaningful connection between the sculpture and the place, and essentially to, to create site-specific sculpture or to create um, connections or viewing experiences that are akin to uh, site-specific practice. What we're trying to avoid is sort of helicoptering work in, though we will get onto helicopters later. <laughs> Um, so as you can see here on the left hand side, it's fairly simple really, some of the parameters that you know one can identify certainly in the garden environment, the flora, so the plants, the trees, the shrubs, and there's you know many variables thereof. The landscape, so that's either the innate landscape, for example, um, Burley is situated on a seam of limestone and that runs through the whole site. Um, it also runs down to a special scientific interest a few miles away called the Hills and Hollows, which is where they took the stone uh, for Peterborough Cathedral. So you're getting into geology and time there. But we've also got the man-made la uh, landscape as well, because obviously with that garden design, for example, the lake that we saw in the first slide and we'll come on to in a minute, was actually dug by hand, believe it or not, uh, at a time when there was no, uh, no machinery, essentially. So it was load on, load off. Michael, could I just interrupt really, for a second? Yeah. I'm sorry, could you make your screen full screen, um, possibly? Because it, it would be nice to have a, a bigger picture of uh, what you're doing. Well, it, yeah, I mean, it is full screen at the moment. We, we can see, we, we can't see it all. Oh, OK. Let's try again. We can see all your slides. And then if you could just re-enter it, that would be good. Thank you. I'll do my best, but I have... Um, that's what was up. So. Uh, is that better? We can't see your picture yet. You need we, we need to be able to see the side. We just say it just says that you've started to share your screen. Um, okay, well, that uh, I mean that is. Do you see anything now? No. Do you see that now? We still haven't got the image, no. Hmm. Did you have it before? We had an image, but we, it was small and we, we had all your, it, you needed to put it on full screen. I mean, the thing is, I, I'm at the moment, I am on full screen. Yeah. Do you see that now? 
Michael. Yes. Hi, it's Flora from Art UK. I can uh, share that for you on my screen. And then uh, hopefully you, okay. and you can tell me yeah. to click through. Okay. That so might I'm... be the way to do Let's it. And do then it. if people in the chat can tell me if they can see that, okay? That's it. Brilliant. Okay. Uh, that's yeah. Good. Okay. If you could, uh, where were we? If you could go down one, please. Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, so the so the I think we just uh, forgive me for that. <laughs> it's like Zoom terror. Um, so we talked about the flora, the landscape, and the elements. Uh, the three remaining sort of factors that one can consider are the architectural features. So we have a series of dry stone walls. Um, there's a boathouse. There's a mausoleum and an ice house. Um, then we shift into things like garden design, which you know, which are obviously much more man-made. So the pathways, uh, the streams, the lake itself, the dam that holds the lake back. Um, interesting, one cannot install sculptures at any depth depth on the lake, as I found on the dam, as I found out, because it's protected by the uh, Reservoir 19674 Act. <laughs> um, and then we have the house itself. So if you could be so kind as to move on. Could you go to the next slide, please? Yes, lovely. Um, oh no, back one, please. So there should be a plane. Um, so here you can see some of the landscaping that we are lucky enough to benefit from. So um, on the left-hand side, you've got Down to Earth, Earth by Hex, which was a, a life-size representation of a Junker bomber, a dive bomber. Uh, and this was made by a German sculptor. It's actually located in what is uh, essentially an amphitheatre. So the premise was it kind of crash landed or come to ground and that natural bowl exists. Um, the second piece, obviously, you know, there's obvious connections between the dazzle ship by Andy Hazel uh, and the lake and the runoff, the sort of um, jetty slipway to the lake itself. Um, could we move on, please? Yes, again, so picking up that notion of the vistas and the pathways, obviously, um, that's obviously something that, again, that changes over the course of time, depending on um, how the extent to which, for example, laurel is cut back or tree husbandry. So it's a kind of dynamic thing. So that, that those vistas through the landscape can actually change quite rapidly. Um, for example, with the sighting of uh, garland necklace by Owen Bullitt, we try to take advantage of that. Or we'll also, um, as you can see on the right hand side, Richard Trupp's sculpture, which kind of looks like this wedge that had fallen out of the sky. Now, from two or three of the pathways by which you came upon the sculpture, you couldn't see it in advance. So you would turn a, turn a corner and then all of a sudden you're seeing the sculpture. So, that, so that you're heightening that element of surprise um, by the placement of the work itself. Um, next, please. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've worked with the flora and the moment you put anything highly reflective outside, it's going to take on its um, surroundings. And that's going to obviously work in an urban environment as well. You've probably seen the pictures of um, Anish Kapoor's highly polished works, you know, the piece Cloud Gate in Chicago. Uh, somehow in, in the natural landscape where it's quite green, you've got quite samey colours and somehow that really helps things integrate. So for example, Louis Plant's piece on the right hand side uh, it's higher polished stainless steel. So as the viewer moved around that, the sculpture would kind of appear and disappear. So certain viewpoints is more visible, uh, and in other viewpoints, it becomes more camouflaged. Uh, likewise, uh, Stefano's piece was actually made from mirrors. So again, that high reflectivity is using or exploiting the surroundings. Uh, next, please. OK, so I don't think I need to tell you the title of this one. Um, I've always really liked this piece because um, it's one of those occasions when an artist comes to you and proposes something. It's a very sort of poetic mix of topiary and sculpture. Obviously, the, the features of the rabbit are defined by the aluminium. Um, the rest of the body is sort of defined by the bush and the shrub. So left hand side obviously was pretty much went it, when it went in. And now it's um, grown a lovely coat. It looks a lot happier. <laughs> Uh, next, please. Um, so this is Growth System by Julian Wilde. Now, we have, um, in collaboration with 
various different sculptors and artists installed work directly onto trees and tree trunks. In this case, it's a dead horse chestnut tree. And Julian's sculpture is not so much a drawing as a space as a drawing on the tree. And as you can see, uh, in certain parts, the ivy's uh, growing over it. Now, this sculpture has been in nearly 10 years now. So it's in a constant state of flux. There's a kind of battle between nature and the work. And I think that's quite interesting as well for people, you know, perhaps the more local visitors who are regular, they get to see that change over the course of time and through the years. Uh, next, please. Yeah, so this piece is slightly in the vein of the uh, American sculptor Tara Donovan, who uses very much everyday materials. And here you can see Taz Lovejoy's just really use flower pots. And again, that's sort of quite prophetic in its connection back to the to the place that you're visiting. And this sculpture was installed in the Weeping Willow and the various forms kind of look like dahlias as well. So there's there's a kind of um, ongoing relationship between the material of the work, its location and what it looks like. Next, please. Um, here, yes, again, so we've got various different sculptures here. These have actually been built around the tree itself. So the tree not only uh, is the location and the means for elevating the work, it also kind of becomes part of the work. Now, intersections by Nick Horrigan was quite interesting because the inner cube is actually made from uh, industrial shrink rack, which you know, to give it its common name is cling film. Um, but what was interesting about this was it's you know it's highly responsive to the elements, so that when you um, depending on the quality of the daylight at any given moment, it could shift between translucent, transparent, and opaque. So that's quite interesting. Whereas Will's Nash's piece was much more sort of kind of op optical, so that would kind of oscillate between almost appearing to be flat. Uh, and actually sort of being fully dimensional. Whereas Richard's piece, the, the kind of sword, um, to give you a sense of scale there, that's probably hitting about the five metre mark. So again, that's using the, the sort of physicality of some of these trees when you get outside. I mean, what is noteworthy, you have to put some seriously large objects outside for them to hold the spaces when, when, when landscape becomes open. Uh, next, please. So as previously mentioned, one of the other things we're sort of lucky enough to benefit from is a range of architectural features in the garden. Now, there are a lot of dry stone walls, some of which remain in good condition, others have sort of collapsed folly style. And this uh, was a kind of giant wicker installation by an artist called Sue Kirk, where, as the title suggests, you kind of get the impression of this work kind of going through the wall as it sort of rises up like a boat at the back. Now, this is probably around about, it's kind of roughly elliptical, so it's about six metres at its kind of extreme length. So in terms of, uh, you know, an artist taking a, a kind of way of working that we would kind of associate with something almost domestic, it's quite, it is sort of quite noteworthy to see it on such a large scale. Uh, next, please. Yeah, so here we've got a, a cross section of other pieces that we have over the years installed on other sections of walls or in the case of um, Rubber Blubber by Avril Elwood she kind of created these sort of jelly like fish sorry jellyfish like uh, creatures that the, the, the way we installed them they appeared to be coming through the roof line in the crack um, as you might imagine Sheila Volmer's spring two leaps over the wall so you only get to see one side of the sculpture from the side you're on obviously and then you become slowly aware that there's something else going on as you move around the whole garden. Um, and I've always had a soft spot for the grass form piece as well, um, which if anybody's curious is made from AstroTurf. <laughs> um, next please. Yes, we're super lucky to uh, benefit from an ice house, which um, as well as being uh, cool, as you imagine when you go down the bottom, it's actually quite high, so it's approximately um, six meters high and five meters in diameter. And you enter from a kind of higher elevated position. So when, when you walk into the building, probably uh, two thirds of the space is actually underneath your feet. So it's quite interesting, um, as well as being dark and a kind of perfect place to locate and install neon and light works, as in the case of Timepiece by Andrew Stonia, you also get a very different view of sculpture because it's not 
not not that often that you get to look down on it. You know, you're either looking at it at your eye height or up at it. Again, <clears throat> due to the sort of um, generous spaces, we've also been able to hang the stuff from the from the ceiling, kind of stale stalactite, stalagmite style, um, with an enemies by Sam Lee. Uh, and then I'm just going to show you a final piece, if I may, on the next slide. Uh, in which the artist has kind of taken advantage of it, sort of looking a bit like a rocket silo. So Blue Streak by Anthony Carr is uh, is a, is kind of site specific in many ways. And the uh, kind of rocket itself is a giant cyanotype, which upon it are various moon trails that Anthony photographed using um, pinhole cameras over a number of months at Burley. Uh, and then that was translated onto the sort of paper rocket. Uh, and the whole frame is kind of the premise of this sort of rocket launcher. So again, um, it's an artist who's making reference, well, actually making work of site, making reference to site, and then exploiting aspects of the site to, to contribute to the totality of their work. Uh, if we might move on. Yes, so, um, Local materials. So we have on many occasions kind of made work at site and that has, um, well, you know, it's a bit like Frank Lloyd Wright when he went into the desert to make his um, some of his buildings, he used what was available to him, partly because it integrates work with place, but also because you don't have to go so far to fetch it. Um, these days, and maybe that's not so applicable, but uh, Robert Fung's piece, uh, on the left hand side, that timber cladding there was sourced locally. Uh, the main and the tail is all kind of wood that was found on the estate. Um, and the, I should say, I'm, I, I, I find it really difficult not to call it the Trojan horse because the gardeners with whom I work in, they have nicknames for all the sculptures. So I have to be super scared, careful. <laughs> um, but skip tank or rather canary, uh, is a, I really like this piece. It's sort of sat on the dam, and kept guard over lake. Uh, and as you can see, if you're a fan of phone numbers, you will know that 01733 is a Peterborough local to Stanford phone code. So that gives a clue as to where the skip came from. So those things that come from nearby don't actually have to be uh, natural for them to sort of have some connection to where you're at. Uh, in the next slide, we are going to see um, Dennis O'Connor's piece here again that uses local stone. Um, and this was created by the artists who work a lot with Andy Goldsby. I'm going to speed up a little bit now if we can go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, again, this was a piece by Stuart Ian Frost where he used oaks that were felled on the estate. Uh, the fleur de lis he found on a lot of the uh, furniture within the house. So again, it was local materials, local motif. Um, I think if we might go to the next slide. Yeah, again, these are two pieces where uh, artists have exploited the house history. Georgia Phipps took inspiration from drawings and designs uh, of the architecture of the building, whereas Lee Brady was referencing in this kind of really fantastic six meter sculpture uh, you know, the fact that we are in a garden as well, obviously, and something strange is afoot. Uh, we're going to see some images of the lakes in a second. Ah, we're going to run through elements quickly. If you... So obviously, once you go outside, you have natural light, daylight. Um, piece on the left was a sonic audio sculpture that changed intensity according to uh, the intensity of sunlight, whereas we have dark spaces again where we can install electric works. Uh, in the next slide, we're going to see uh, Mike, again pieces Mike, that. Mike, yep. we've got Mike. two minutes. If don't mind. Okay. Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah. So this, uh, so this piece here again, we have uh, two artists trying to incorporate or use or exploit sunlight as well. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Again, this was quite interesting in the sense that it used exploited rain, so it began to dissolve. Uh, as the course of the uh, exhibition went through. So it's not a permanent work. And the next slide is looking at pieces that, so this basically sprayed water again. So when it rained, the, the effect of the water splashing on the lake was kind of augmented. And the final two slides of the elements work, 
this was a uh, lunar cycle by Pete Rogers, who, uh, whose piece actually responds or describes the waxing and the waning of the moon, and that span around really quickly. And then he repeated that in the next slide to create a series of swans. Now, any super fans of uh, PowerPoint links will enjoy the next one as we, well, we either stop because we're running out of time or I can carry on for a minute. Mike, if you could stop because we're not going to have time yeah. for questions. If, if okay, you sure. Just bring it to a close, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's fine. So, um, I mean, I was just going to show some shots of installations and just make the point that, you know, all, although these worked look really effortless, there's an incredible amount of engineering and hard work uh, and machinery that goes into bringing these into place. But yeah. hopefully you've got an overview of how, uh, by categorizing the aspects of the uh, landscape that one can um, exploit and hopefully create meaningful connections with place outdoors. Thank you. Thank you so much. A really enormous amount of material there uh, for us all to think about and consider. And um, it'd be great to get all the, we've got all the panelists up, haven't we? Um, I'm trying to keep track of these, these papers. I suppose one of the things that comes out and, and one of the questions that we've been asked is, is really about how these kinds of display set an agenda for the future. Um, how they can, you know, what's happening, what, what has happened in the past. How, how can we kind of revivify that today? I suppose one of the things that struck me about the the papers, um, the last two papers, and well, all of them really, was the ownership of the works by the people who live with them on a day-to-day -day basis. I think you just mentioned the gardeners having their, you know, in, in, the, in the context of their, their ownership of the works on site at Burley. And, and again, the, those kind of images you showed to Leila of students interacting with the works and they're becoming a familiar part of their uh, of their kind of everyday experience. I just wondered if if um, you wanted to comment a little bit about about the you know the, these kind of the revivifying as it were of town art of of campus art in the 1950s 60s going forward. How how do you see that as as being something that we can we can reuse, we can reposition, and, and in order to revivify our towns and cities today, what part can sculpture play in that? Well, I, um, I don't, uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> I yes, don't know who I'll say don't know who it was directed to in particular, um, but I mean, um, one of the ways we've done that, um, I mentioned in the talk um, how we sort of animated the uh, Mitzi Cunliffe sculpture for its 60th anniversary. I mean, um, I tried to highlight the, the problem that the artist, in, in fact, had had with it all along was that it was so high up and people couldn't interact with it. And this was really important for her understanding of the work. And that was that was back in the 50s. Um, and of course, nowadays, we really want to, to keep these things alive. So, um, so we had all sorts of events that that drew attention to it through dance and talk and all this sort of thing. And, and the piece by Sue Lottie in the pavement uh, now hopefully draws people's eye up because you have you literally walk on it and you feel the difference in your, I, I should have shown a picture of the final piece really, then it forces you to look up again, so. Yeah, thank you. And, and one of the questions that has come up is about audiences again. Um, and, and that is, is for you, Michael, which is, um, did the Burley House exhibitions have a concern with the audiences they attract as the Scottish Newtown art projects did? I mean, they're different locations, of course, but... Um, yeah, well, I was just, I was typing an answer there, really. It was, um, I mean, the thing is, Burley, you know, has a very high visitor numbers, so um, now you get a mix of people there from local and regional people to people on day trips. So I think you have to be aware of that kind of that kind of dynamic. So um, it's uh, it's trying to develop projects or show work that is more accessible as a kind of conduit to then engaging people who might not necessarily be regular gallery, gallery goers with work that's kind of more conceptually complex or um, you know, abstract, but it, sometimes it's quite difficult to foresee exactly what's going to be popular. You know, um, frankly, things that are big, you know, they're, they're always impressive. Things that have got a lot of technical 
you know, skill, you know, for example, Hex's plane, the, the engineering in that is just, mm. you know, phenomenal. So even if you don't necessarily like sculpture or art, you are gonna, you're gonna be drawn and be impressed by that. So I think it's trying to balance, as I say, I think it's striking a balance between things that have a, you know, an instant motif that you can latch onto, um, to things that then are, that, that then are a bit more esoteric or challenging, but you know, mm. the old adage, oh, the old adage of you can't please everybody applies. <laughs> I suppose we've got just about a minute left, but I suppose one of the questions that's come in is what are the panel's thoughts on how public art is positioned within a wider programme of creative placemaking, making for the future evolution of towns or villages or cities come to that? Um, I just wondered if very briefly any of you would like to just comment on that before we close. Um. Yes, Andrew. In my research, I found a substantial difference between what was going on in the new towns with the town artists um, compared with uh, artist residencies. Artist residencies seem to emerge later, sort of beginning in the later 70s and 80s. And mm -hmm. we have much more of that now. And you get a very different kind of work produced. And that can be posi a positive thing, a positive difference. Um, but I also think that uh, there are substantial benefits uh, for artists being uh, embedded in place for an extended period and for being involved at an early stage in any kind of planning, because it's very difficult for them to make uh, any uh, uh, as much of a meaningful uh, mark if, if things are left too late and it becomes mere decoration. Yes. Thank you. I'm afraid we're going to have to stop there. I mean, there are so many questions. And of course, the, the sessions which now follow on, we've got uh, the next session uh, is on new approaches to curation and research. We'll pick up on some of these ideas. And I'm sure by the end of the two days, we're going to be very kind of, you know, all kinds of things are going to be in circulation and discussion. But I wanted to say a big thank you to all our speakers, you know, terrific papers. I wish we had like a football matches, some kind of crowd noise to come on to applaud you all. But, but thank you. And um, on, we'll kind of close there. I think I also wanted to just thank um, Anthony McIntosh, who's been the host of this session invisibly. Um, thank you all. And I see you again at uh, 4.15, which is the start of the next session. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.